Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am the Nightwalker and uh, tonight we're going to talk about a movie that I gotta be honest with you, I'm actually surprised I never got around to reviewing this already. You know, I've, I've been on YouTube, you know, two separate, you know, channels for over a year now and I gotta be honest, I'm really, really stunned that I never got around to reviewing this movie. But um, yeah, the movie we're going to talk about is from 1974. It's called Deranged. I'm sure everybody's heard about this movie, but um, this movie, you know, it's definitely got a cult following, and you're going to understand why. Uh, the only thing, though, is like, you know, pretty Sally Mae died a very unnatural death, but the worst hasn't happened to her yet. So, but this movie came out in 1974, and ironically, the movie is based on Ed Gein, and so is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and both movies came out in 1974. What are the odds, you know? Um, from my understanding, I think at one point, Bob Clark, was attached to direct this, but he didn't. But I still think uh, as a producer in some capacity, he was the late, great Bob Clark, you know, from Black Christmas and Death Dream, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, Porky's Christmas Story, etc. Uh, I think at one point he was supposed to, um, he was supposed to direct this, but I think he stayed on in, in like a director's or a producer's capacity. But the movie is actually produced by Jeff Gillen and Alan Ormsby, who both of them, if you've seen the movie uh, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, you know who they are. Um, you know, Jeff Gillen, he went on to play Santa Claus in both of Bob Clark's Christmas movies, you know, Black Christmas and A Christmas Story and so on. Um, you know, the movie is written by Alan Ormsby and, uh, you know, it's like I said, it's based on Ed Gein and uh, the movie, it's... Um, you know, it, it's loosely based on Ed Gein. I mean, it follows some details pretty close, but, uh, you know, also too, you know, you got, uh, the special effects in here by, you know, a very young Tom Savini who worked under Alan Ormsby. So the two of them worked together to create the special effects for this movie. And, um, but this movie, even though it's got some comedic moments in it, uh, this movie is pretty disturbing and it's definitely not going to be for everybody's taste, but, you know, I like it and I find it unsettling. Um, you know, you got Robert's Blossom there who let's show you the back here. Yeah, there he is. Robert's Blossom, you know, everybody remembers him from oh, you remember him as the old man with the, you know, shoveling or putting the snow on the sidewalk and home alone, you know, the old man who who uh, befriends Kevin the kid. Um, you know, you remember him from Christine, you know, playing the old man, you know, it's like you don't know half as much as you think you do. Shitter. You know, things like that. So, yeah, you know him. You've seen him and stuff before. But in this movie, it's the, you know, he plays close to Egin. He plays Ezra Cobb, who, um, in the beginning of the movie, you know, the, this movie has a narrator in it. So, uh, which, you know, can be a handicap. It doesn't bother me, but there are, um, there are some people out there, you know, they can't stand movies that have narrators, and that's always been a thing. It's always been a real problem for a lot of people. Um, but the way this movie plays, it almost plays as if you're watching, like, a stage play. You know? Because, like, you know, like a scene will happen, and then the narrator will emerge and say, you know, and then Ezra would, you know, grieving for the loss of his mother would do this or that, and then it would go into the, go into the next scene or whatever. So it does... It very does, very much does, except for like the last, um, probably about the last, uh, you know, third act of the movie and, you know, where, yeah, you don't really see the narrator, but you hear his voice in a couple of instances. But so Ezra, he's, you know, very similar to Ed Gein. He's, he's a middle-aged man. He's, you know, living out at this farmhouse by himself and, uh, the place is a wreck. His mother, you know, who's, uh, in the bed there, she's dying and, um, and so she going on with this long speech and, and it was a little much, I think the narrator could have, you know, explained this whole thing in like one or two sentences, but instead they built kind of an entire scene around it where, um, she's going on and on about, you know, uh, you know, uh, women are harlots and, you know, uh, you know, women, they bring about death and things like that, you know, kind of like if you, if you're a true crime fan, you follow the story of Ed Gein, you're going to find out he had this overbearing mother. Who was uh she was a real religious fanatic and she was always like beating into Ed Gein and his brother Henry. She was always beating into their heads that women were 
horrible and they were harlots and whores and, you know, they were no good and, you know, telling them to stay away from them. And uh, so you got this kind of whole scene where, and then she finally dies. And then, uh, you know, and then uh, we learn right off the bat that the character, sorry, the character of Ezra is pretty disturbed. He's messed up in the head. Um, you know, like they're at the funeral and, and a couple of his friends come up and we're so sorry as, you know, we're sorry she passed away. And he's like, you know, she's, she's fine. She's just sleeping. And, uh, so, you know, later that night he brings, you know, he brings her home and, and, uh, you know, and it, he does like what Ed Gein, you know, did. Well, that was the thing though. Ed Gein never was able to bring home his mother's body. He robbed graves and things, but from my understanding, um, that was always something that, you know, the fiction took over in that aspect of it that, you know, uh, he never actually dug up his mother's grave. He dug up other graves, but not his mother. He couldn't get to the, he couldn't get to his mother's grave or something. But, uh, so anyway, he brings her home and he starts, uh, you know, trying to take care of her and things, but she's, you know, she's a dead body now and she's decomposing and things like that. And, uh, you know, and then we have a scene where, you know, Ezra's, you know, having dinner with, uh, you know, the neighbor's friends and he's, you know, similar like what Egin had done. You know, he, he was a handyman. He did odd jobs, uh, even, you know, like, you know, uh, play with the kids, babysat kids and things like that. And at one point he's having dinner with his family and, um, the, the father, he's reading the newspaper and he's talking about the obituaries. And so he's asking Ezra, you remember you remember this teacher that we had, she died. And, and, uh, he's all like, you know, it says in there that she died. You know, he doesn't know what an obituary is. So the neighbor explains to him, you know, like, this is what it is. You know, it tells you, you know, when they died, how they died, you know, uh, what day the funeral is going to be and all this. And Ezra, you know, you know, uh, the funny thing is everybody thinks that he's being silly. Everybody thinks he's, you know, just, you know, being, having a oddball sense of humor. So he's talking about like, uh, yeah, you know, wow, uh, that could be very useful information, you know, and the son is joking. Yeah. What if you want to go dig her up? It's like, yeah, sure. If you want to go dig her up and you know, you can, you know, um, you don't have to take the whole body, you know, just if you need, you know, you just need the head, you can take the head and, you know, or whatever else. And so, but they think he's joking, you know, and that's what happened in real life too, is that, you know, um, Egin said these things, the funny, the the creepy irritating or not irritating, but the creepy frightening part about it was that, you know, he was dead serious about these things. When he said stuff like this, he meant it, but everybody thought he just had a bad sense of humor, you know? So he's digging up bodies and, and, uh, you know, he's bringing the skulls home and you get to see some of Tom Savini's special effects, which by the way, um, really you would be much better off if you get the Kino Lorber, uh, Blu-ray here. I think they have a DVD of it too. I'm not sure, but if nothing else, at least get the Kino Lorber Blu-ray because this has some um, footage that was edited out. So if you have the the Midnight Movie DVD that has both this and Motel Hell, it's not very good because you know some of the some of the stuff was edited out. But this here, it, it has all the you know the gruesome stuff pretty much put back into it. So, um, so you know, like there's a scene you know that in the in the uh, midnight movie DVD where, you know, he's like scooping the brains out of the skull and stuff like that. It's like, you know, you don't see that in there and in this version you do. So that's what I was saying. This would be the much better one if you want the, the gruesome gory bits. So, but, uh, so yeah, so he, uh, starts, you know, bringing home dead bodies. And then, um, you know, of course we learn that they changed the story a little bit. I mean, in the, in real life, um, again, you know, he, he had this kind of fascination with this local bartender named Mary Hogan. And, uh, you know, so he was, uh, you know, he was always like hanging out at the bar and stuff. And he felt she was kind of immoral woman and things. And one night, apparently he went into her bar or her tavern and apparently he shot her because they found, you know, like bullet casings and a trail of blood going out the door. But the thing was, nobody suspected Ed Gein. First of all, everybody thought there was no way he could do it. And secondly, there were rumblings, there were rumors going around that she might have had like some connections to maybe like, I don't know about like mob ties or anything, but she had like some shady 
you know, connections and they think maybe, you know, she might have met a bad end or something. But but in, in this story here, they they change it around a little bit. Well, first of all, um, I'm going to get into some spoilers. So just so you know, so some spoilers. But uh, like at, at one point, they're talking about setting Ezra up on a date with this woman um, who is a friend of theirs. She was a friend of the mother's. And, uh, you know, they were talking about, oh, Ezra, you need to go out with her. She'd like to see you and stuff like that. And and I believe the actress is Mary Waldman. Uh, does it say on here? No, it doesn't say. I believe it's Mary Waldman. She played the, uh, the house mother in the original uh, Black Christmas. So he goes to see her and she's talking about like she, you know, she's talking. She talks to her dead husband and. At first, Ezra thinks, you know, she's doing the same thing that he's doing, where he's talking to his dead mother. But, you know, she's talking about, like, you know, she talks to him, you know, like, you know, in seances and, you know, you know, via Ouija boards and things like that. And, um, but it's not the way he thought it was. But they decide to make a date and he ends up, you know, I'm not going to try to give away too much, but it, let's just say it doesn't go well. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, at one point he meets this uh, woman who's a bar, you know, she's a barmaid. Um, like I said, she doesn't run the tavern like Mary Hogan did in real life. She just works there as like a cocktail waitress. And so he's just sitting there and he's just kind of like, you know, ogling her. And, and she's all like, you know, telling, Hey buddy, you know, if you want to stay in here, you know, you're going to have to order a drink. And so he's all like, you know, what, what would you recommend? And, you know, she's like, well, what about a whiskey sour? And so he tries it and he gets drunk. And uh, so he devises a plan that he's going to he's going to uh, rig her tires where, you know, um, basically, you know, like puts holes in her tires and stuff. Then uh, he picks her up and tells her he's going to fix her car for her. Then he takes her to his house and then attacks her. And it's that scene is actually very, very, very scary. It's very well done. It's very it's creepy. It's moody. It's atmospheric. It's very frightening to watch in a good way, in a very good way. And then, you know, he's telling her that he wants to keep her and then um she would never have to do anything, just, you know, um all she would have to do is just, you know, let excuse me, let him know when she wants something, he'll give her anything she wants, he'll do anything for her and, you know, leave it at, let's just say it again, it doesn't go well. And then uh, we finally were getting into the final act of the movie where, um, you know, in real life, you had Bernice Warden, who was the the uh, owner of the Warden hardware store. And it was her and her son, Frank. They were, you know, they ran the hardware store, but he was also deputy sheriff in the town that they lived in, Plainfield, Wisconsin. And, um, you know, setting up that they're going to go out deer hunting. Well, in this one, they change it around a little bit that uh, the girl who, um, runs the hardware store. Uh, she's actually just kind of more like a student and the girl, uh, Pat Orr, Yeah. Who plays the girl? Uh, does it say where? Her... No, it doesn't say, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm trying not to waste your time, but, um, didn't say the name of the girl, but, uh, in real life, you know, she, uh, the woman was Bernice Warden, but Bernice Warden was a, a matronly older, mature woman. In this one here, she's very young and very gorgeous and super beautiful. I remember being, uh, when I first watched this movie, I remember being very taken with so, My God, that woman is beautiful. You know, that Pat Orr, she is striking. She is so lovely, so beautiful. But, um, so anyway, so yeah, kind of similar to what happened in real life. You know, they go and, um, it, but it turns out she's actually the girlfriend of his Ezra, he's got the, you know, the family he's friends with. She's actually the girlfriend of his son. And so they're hanging around. They're going to go, you know, deer hunting. And Ezra's like, you know, I'm just here to get some antifreeze, which, you know, that's what Ed Gein did that day. And uh, he goes and he's checking the rifles and he puts a bullet in one and shoots her, but he doesn't, doesn't kill her. And then you get to the, you know, the really creepy scenes, you know, where, you know, she's trying to get away from him and, it's almost, you know, it's very much like a nightmare. You know, it's like this poor girl. It's like, no matter what she do, she can't get away from it. You know, and it's, oh yeah. And then you come up with the ending where, you know, I'm just going to say something like this kind of plays into it, but I'm sorry. I know I give away too much of it already, but I was trying not to give away all the movie, but overall this movie, it's, you know, it's very good. It's, uh, you know, 
not the most rewatch value in the world, but it's still it's I enjoy it. You know, it's a good, creepy movie. Um, it's not 100 percent true to the Egin story. It does change some things. It is a um, it is a fictionalized version of the Egin story. But, you know, it's like it does come pretty close. And in 1974, if you figure, okay, it's like, like I said, this movie came out in 74 and it was based on Iggy and same thing with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Really, at that time, if you wanted a movie that kind of gave you the real details about Ed Gein, you know, which one would be the best one? This would have been it. Because, you know, as great as Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, that movie really does take a lot more fictional liberties with the Ed Gein story. This one here follows the story a lot more closely. From my understanding, when um, Alan Ormsby was writing the screenplay that he had, he had collected like newspaper clippings and, and that's how he got a lot of the details of the crimes and, you know, from stories and, and confession from Ed Gein that he got out of newspaper clippings and things like that. So, but, um, yeah, I would definitely say if you're into this subject matter, if you're into Ed Gein, um, you know, unless, I mean, unless you're like one of those like purists who's all like, no, I want like, when it comes to uh, true crime, I want, you know, as close to real life as I can. I don't want any kind of fictionalization in it at all. Then, uh, yeah, you may not like this too much. But, you know, if you're like, you know, yeah, I can abide some some little, you know, changes to the real life story. But as long as you get the general idea, then, yeah, this movie would be pretty good for you to watch. And, um, you know, it's like you do get some gruesome stuff. Like I said, you got young Tom Savini at work here. And, uh, the combination of his work and Alan Ormsby, they do great work, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, this movie is, it's definitely something, you know, like I said, not the most rewatch value in the world, but you know, every once in a while I get in the mood, I'm in the mood to watch this. So it's pretty good. I enjoy it. So like I said, yeah. Um, if you have the uh, midnight movie DVD edition, seriously, like I said, uh, I do believe this is on DVD. So even if you don't want it on Blu-ray check, I think they, I think Kino Lorber put out a DVD version of this. So look for that if nothing else. Because like I said, this has a lot more uncensored stuff in it than than that than that version does. But anyway, that's going to pretty much do it, I think. I think I said everything I wanted to say about it. Uh, like I said, I'm just surprised it took me this long to get around to it. So yeah, if anybody takes the time to watch this video, I thank you for doing it. I appreciate you for doing it. I also hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. There'll be weekly videos posted. and. Uh, until then, I'm the Nightwalker, and uh, you might want to be careful because some night you might be out strolling, and you never know, I could be hiding in the dark.